There we go. <laughs> Didn't realize we were alive. <laughs> We're, we're live, and we're really actually live here at our loft. So this is learning flight number 71. We yeah. are doing, yeah, dynamic duos and blends. So really, there's only one duo in this mix tonight. The rest are all kind of like three, mostly no, three grapes. Two. Three grapes. Oh. For me, they're all three grapes, I believe. And then, mm -hmm. um, and then for you, I yeah. think that it's, two it's and... mostly two, and then the cheeses are three. Yeah. So your meats are two and your cheeses are three. So the meats are our, yeah. du our dynamic duo tonight. Everything else is kind of a blend of a trio. It's a menage a trois. Trois, yeah. exactly. <laughs> so we're starting off in Italy. Uh, like we were just talking about, we're starting off in Tuscany. So um, this is just, this is Canteen Day. And this is a family owned and operated um, winery in the Matapolciana region of Tuscany, which is basically in South the southeastern part of Tuscany. And then Tuscany is really in like northwestern part of Italy. So it's very hilly. It's um, it's mm -hmm. also like they've they've actually like the original founder is now the third the third generation is um, is oh my goodness gracious. I'm like, what is her name? It's um it's what is it? Oh my goodness. I can't believe I'm just like, where did it go? Where is her name at? Katarina, I believe but I feel like I'm wrong on her name right now. And I can't see it on my thing because I forgot my glasses. So. Well, mine. <laughs> ah. Anyways, she is the matriarch right now of the, of the family um, winery basically. And I'm really, it's really killing me that I can't find her name and this is embarrassing, but it is what it is. So she is the one who is leading the family and basically kind of leading the, um, we did the charge. Her father, uh, her grandfather, was the one who originally founded the um, the winery and also the vineyard, and that was back in 1964. And his name was Ali Brando, and she's been running it. I want to say like her father was then next, and then she has been running it since the I want to say like the early 2000s, late 90s. So, and she is also um, a singer by trade. So she or by passion, I guess I should say, not by trade, but she sings as well. And her grandfather, when he when he built this property and found this property, it was in an area, this is at a time, they're kind of new to, new to this area and they're considered to be like new on the block, the new kids in this region, because they only started in the 1960s. And these are a lot longer, like six generations for a lot of their neighboring wineries and sellers. So for them, they're the younger kids and when they when he started it, he originally had a travertine business, and that was where he made his money. And so when he built the cellar, he had this in like vision of building a travertine cellar into the hill, basically, and creating just a very like natural cellar. He felt that would really go yeah. great for building a cellar, and it turned out to be true. He also originally they had white white grape varietals planted at the front of the winery and at like leading up into the vineyard, he thought that would be better to be red and that the red would grow better there. So he pulled those out and then began to plant the first plantings of Montepulciano in that area. So in this area though, it's also named the street and the reason why it's called Mar Martiana. And it is the name of the street, but it's also the name of the house. And so that's where the wine variety, the wine and blend gets its name from. And it is a blend of Malvasia and then also um, Brachetto and Trebbiano Toscana. So there is other Trebbiano, but this is specifically Trebbiano Toscana, which means obviously from this region. It's a very specific, only grows in this region in the world. So it's all done in stainless steel um, and it is absolutely delicious. And I am very mm -hmm. excited to taste this with the cheese. And to me, we were talking about what, what would you compare this to? And we decided Sauvignon Blanc because it does have nice citrus to it. Um, it has great acidity yeah, and it to me is like, it's very aromatic, super, mm -hmm. super like white flowers on the nose, like honeysuckle kind of thing going mm -hmm. on. So we, we pair that with uh, a cheese that come not from Tuscany, but from Piedmont, mm -hmm. which is north of there, uh, made by the Artalanga. A creamery and it's called Latour. It's made of three different milk, 
cow, sheep, and, and goat. And uh, it's a very creamy, very creamy cheese. It'd be similar to a, yeah. like a Delice de Bourgogne in France, but with three different milk. The, the, the adding of the, of the uh, goat milk and sheep milk has a little bit of tartness to the, to the cheese. So it's not like pure butter, like you, most of the triple cream in France are like uh, milk, milk cheese, milk cow, cow milk cheese, and they are very buttery in flavor. I mean, some, some of them is like eating butter right out of the package. So uh, this is a little more balanced with, uh, with the addition of the goat milk and, and the sheep milk. Uh, the reason, I think there is maybe a reason for that because it seemed that there is, uh, if you look at where the, cheese come, the cheeses come from, uh, most of the area that do only milk, cow milk cheese are uh, area that have a lot of grazing area for the cow. So have a big production of milk from the cow. Uh, area like Spain and Italy don't have as much green, but in the, you know, it's in the, close to the Mediterranean. So there's a lot of wash and, and there's not as much uh, prairie for the cow to graze. So I think the production of milk was maybe not as enough production for them to make the cheese and through the year they've added the other two milk because the goat can be uh, eating dirt out of the rocks and they'll produce milk. So I think that's a way to balance the the fact that they don't have as many cows to to product, product produce enough milk. So but that I guess they figured out that's also a good thing for the cheese after a while and yeah. because they're all very good cheese it's a really interesting soft cheese. yeah like, there's a lot of soft cheese some, some soft cheeses i don't like it has just enough i don't know flavor but not yeah it's not sweet. i like how the goat kind of comes in you know mm -hmm. it's like you don't really taste it until like and then it hits your palate like in the middle of the palate and it just is like it kind of like builds up a richness i feel like and adds to it they also, which is what I think adds a complexity that you don't get normally. The goat stay very close to the wine, I think. Yeah. And that's, that's typical of most of the uh, creamy goat cheese. They will love that real like cream that come out when you cut it right next to the wine. And the inside stay more more solid than, than the outside close to the wine. So like cheese like um, Umbo Fog and things like that, yeah. they have that layer of a right. real heavy cream of goat cheese on the outside. So yeah. uh, it's real nice too with Castel Trano, Castel Vetrano olives on the side. So with that wine, I would suggest going with the with the cheese and the wine, those green olives that we put on there. They come from Italy too. So it's a good, you know, whatever goes together, goes together. So we try to stick to this and when we do the testing. <laughs> this one reminds me kind of like it looks like a brain at first you know like it's wrinkly mm -hmm. it's got that wrinkly rind to it mm. me too i'm with you on that <laughs> Well, brie is kind of the basic uh, triple cream cheese. And it's yeah. it's very mild in flavor, uh, and they, they like to keep it that way. I guess it's kind of the from the area we go. It's made. It's like something that you don't want to over over flavor your cheese because it's the area of Champagne, which is kind of a more uh, softer and and more delicate wine and some of the wine of Italy and, and France and Spain uh, can take better uh, to, a, to a goat cheese or to a sheep milk than the, the cow milk is usually kind of bland unless you actually air, brine, brine the, the, the wine and wash the wine with wine then it develops more flavor like a Taleggio or a Pont 
but usually the caramel are kind of a blend of flavor, usually. They're soft. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. That's why you kind of but, want the goat cheese in the shoot to, to yeah, it's, rich in it's, it all. You know, this is a nice addition. And uh, it, they all bring their own little thing to the to the cheese, you yeah. know. It's just like they said uh, sometimes the, the mutts, the mixed cheese, mixed dog are always better than the full breed dog. <laughs> and that's the same. It brings all the quality of all those milk into the cheese. And it's the same with the wine. Like we're um, one of the things that they were also saying, like with the with the what they strive for with this is why they chose these three grapes actually is because the Malvasia gives it the fruit, the aromatics, the Brachetto gives it the acidity, and then the mm -hmm. um, the Trebbiano gives it more of like that structure as well. Yeah. So it's you each each part of it has its its part really. Mm -hmm. And it just ends up being just delightful, in my opinion. Yeah, well, the acidity of it just it goes, goes with good that. with the fatty. Yeah, it cheese, cuts through so. it, which is what you always kind of want mm -hmm. with wine and cheese when you want to contrast and complement together. So we'll go to France next if we're ready. All right, Raymond's favorite. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. So we've we've talked about this one before, oh, yeah, that, but yeah, but we've um but we've haven't talked about it in a while. I was I was looking to see like what was the last time that we did this one and it was flight thirty one, I think was the last time that wow. we that we talked about the uh, Chateau yeah. du Cos. And it's 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 one that um that we've we just kind of always carry here, I wanna say, because it's just delicious. It's mostly semi on. Um, and then it also has some Sauvignon Blanc and then also some Muscadel. And um, the Sauvignon, really, like, this is an area that um, in Bordeaux that is known more for sauternes. So, and that is basically a dessert wine where they let the Sauvignon grapes develop botrytis, which is what they call noble rot. And so the grapes really, like, they, they ripen so much that they over-ripen and then they start to kind of almost like ferment inside themselves with the sugars and then become raisiny almost and develop this mold that then they they use to just kind of like press and turn into a dessert wine that's absolutely delicious and is fantastic with foie gras and that's pretty much what it's known for in this area so this is the dry white wine version of sauterne otherwise known as bordeaux blanc because they are not allowed to call it anything but Bordeaux Blanc, because it is not Sauterne. It is a dry white wine, mm -hmm. not the dessert wine from this region. So that is pretty much why you'll see it called Bordeaux Blanc, not Grave or any of the other regions in this air in Bordeaux. It's not, it doesn't really have a designate as the other whites do in this area. So if that makes sense. <laughs> does it have Semillon in it? It does. It's yeah. mostly Semillon. And then, yeah. And then it also has the Muscadel and also the Sauvignon Blanc as mm. well. So, but it is mostly Semillon. That is the, is the main like workhorse grape of this blend. Mm -hmm. um, and it is all of the grapes are vinified in stainless steel for six months. Um, the average age of the vines here are 45 to 48 years old. And they are mostly planted in um, soils of clay and limestone on a fissured rock, is what it says about the about this the one soils. Is more like white ripe food than the red one, I think, on the nose. Um, the white, more white grapefruit. Yeah, and like flint. Yeah, no, yeah. There's flint definitely stone. more of of the minerality on the nose in my opinion, on this yeah. one than there was where you had like flowers before. Now you have kind of like that, like like the flinty, what you're saying, mm -hmm. in the, the, the limestone minerality to it. And the aromatics kind of go to that versus floral, in my opinion. <laughs> that's my yeah. that's my dance with it too. <laughs> so which area is it made in? In, in the same area as Hattern. Okay. So in between. Yeah. And so, and then they also, they do have, um, they also do have a home um, in another winery actually in um, the Grave Appalachian. And so that one is called 
uh, Romeo Lacoste, which is in the Obarzac. So, and that's mm-hmm. his, his, that's on his mother's side. So they have a few different properties, um, but this is pretty much the, their border walk from all of this one. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. And Irv de Baudier is, or de, de Baudier, de Baudieu, sorry, de Baudieu, yeah. is the winemaker sure. and also the, the owner of the, 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 the patriarch now of this winery. Cellar Chateau. That's pate. So tell us about the pate. Okay, this pate is uh, it's a blend, like a lot of the pate are actually. Uh, we actually were surprised we didn't have a blend pate before, so we brought this one in. Yeah. Um, most most every pate you you'll try have or uh, pork pork meat in it or pork fat, because that's um, that's the meat that has the most flavor for fat, to, uh, except for um, duck, duck fat, which is a lot stronger. So this is a duck pate, so it's made with duck meat and mostly with uh, pork fat and also with cognac, which is, um, it's a, cognac is brandy, basically, <laughs> from the cognac region, which is not far from where the wine is made either. Um, it is very delicate, so it's nice to have a wine that doesn't kind of overpower the pâté. But to bring a little better zest to the pâté too, you might want to have it with some of the cornichon, which is usually the way we eat pâté in France. You don't eat pâté by itself. It's always, uh, you need a little acidity from the tiny pickles. Uh, it's it's made, in, this pâté is not made in France, it's made in America on a, a, a French license uh, because uh, I think it's because it's uh, the meat that you use have to be uh, to be pro- um, produced here. So then it, with a USDA regulation, uh, it's um, it's a very very nice uh, mellow pate. It's got that that. Uh, a little better duck flavor, but the good thing that they, do, they didn't use a duck fat, actually, I think, is because it would be too too much duck forward and not not as uh, delicate as it is right now. That's something that would be real nice, too, is a little uh, currant jelly on the toss, on the toast. Or it goes usually very good with duck. Um, Have these little sour dark dried cherries? Yeah. yeah, that would go okay with that, too. Mm-hmm. And uh, but like most most pâtés are always made. I mean, you'll have uh, the, the t- typical country pâté is mostly pork, and but sometimes they add they will add like rabbit meat, they will add um, duck pheasant, but most of the, the it's just like most of the time if you make if you're making hot food in and you make like chili or spaghetti sauce or meatball, you don't want to just use like beef because beef is dry so uh, or veal same thing so usually when you do meatball uh, you you mix different meat in and usually always use pork same when you make chili you're always going to use some pork with your beef because that's what bring more flavor because as pork fat cook is it develop more flavor into the meat and you also keep the rest of the meat kind of moist where the beef would dry out so like if you you know, it's like, this is basically like uh, a fancy meatloaf, except it's, <laughs> you know, you cook it the same way, basically, except it has to be cooked in a, in a, in a water bath. So it's like a co- cooked in a bain-marie when you cook it in, a, in, a, in your oven, you bake it basically in the water in the dish to make the pâté uh, like you would do a, uh, um, meat, a meatloaf but you're using a, a, a soft, a more ground meat than you would use uh, in a meatloaf, except on some of the few real uh, coarse pâté. And then what you do is when you take them out and you cool them, you cool them with a weight off. So then it press the meat together. And as the, the fat cools off, it's what binds the meat as a, like a loaf, basically. So the, usually the fat 
goes to the top, but it keeps some of the fat inside the meat. And that's what differentiates your, your meatloaf from a pate too, because uh, meatloaf, you just take out a thing and the fat stay in the dish and it's not part of the dish, it just helps with cooking. So in this, you get some of the fat in there that is already inside the meat and that keep it moist. But it's basically the same technique. Yeah. It is, yeah. Yeah. But you, you, but I mean, some of them are very coarse too. And that's so the difference between the mousse and the pate. That's the country part. This is, yeah, yeah this is a mousse. So yeah. it's, uh, the, oh, the mousse bean and it's like ground, ground Smooth, very fine. Like this. And, and, uh, but you have pate that have, you also have pate that have chunk of different meat in it. And mm -hmm. when you cut it, you can I'm see not it. <laughs> so, and some pate, uh, you had mushroom in them. So pate have added olives or pistachio, or depending on the flavor you want to give to your pate. So there is, there must be like hundred and some kind of pate if you go to France in a dairy shop and you can like pick, you know, they do it with game. They do it with uh, one of the meats you don't do chicken with because it would be too dry as chicken. I know they, they add chicken fat to some of the pate, but the, the chicken, if you use chicken for pate, you're going to be using the liver because that doesn't dry out. But if you, can, if you use white meat, it's just dry. Now, the, what they do with chicken is they do what they call a ballotine, which is like a, a pate that they roll like a foie gras torchon in a, in, a, in a skin and then in a towel, and then you poach it. So you poach it in like chicken stock so it doesn't dry out. And then it, as it cool up, you just, instead of having a square pate, you have a round loaf of chicken ballantine, which is the name for a pate. So there's so many different ways to do it with all the meats. And I think it came also from the time where you, you know, when they cook, when they killed the pig and the farm, they had to use all the meat to do something for the whole winter. And pate is going to keep good because it's sealed in fat. So all those productions started with the killing of the pig way back. Same thing in Italy. They have to use the whole thing in sausages and pates and hams and salamis. So basically that's when it all started. In France, we love pate because you never get tired of eating pate because there's so many of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so many different kinds. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Any questions about the whites before we got to the reds? Right. No, they're not. Yeah, they're 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 all. I I don't want to. I don't know what the original musk go go whatever grape is. Um, I, I don't think that they're all necessarily connected the way that we think that they would be, okay. you know, because they're all in, but, but I'm not positive because I'm not, that's that. Yeah. I don't study the science of the grapes and I want to know that I, I was wondering that too. So, and I'm like, everything I was looking at basically is like, well, they call it this in this region, this in that region. And it's like, they're there. Are they really related or is it like, but they're different. So, but I don't think it's muscadine. Okay. I think it's, I think that the muscadelle is the original one. And then there is muscadet and more along that line than there, than the muscadine. I think yeah. the muscadine is the U S version okay. from what I understand, which is different, but I yeah. have, but I'm not positive. Like I said, <laughs> so now we'll go to France or not France. Now we're going to go to Spain. I mean, we're leaving France and going to Spain, and yeah. we're going to switch over to our reds now. So, all righty. So now, yeah, so now we're going to the Monsant region of Spain. The, the pate, no, this one. The pate took a nice bite away from the from the, from the acidity oh, yeah. of the wine. Yeah. It's a lot less acidity of the pate. Good. Yeah. Right. I think. Mm 
That's two. <laughs> just, just be negative. Oh, Mark, can you shut the door? Sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no. All right. So, Jasper Negre. So this is a a collaboration of brothers. And so this is um, Tony and Miguel, and they started this winery mm. and this project in 2006. And they basically really, um, they're, they started it in Monsant, which is, yeah, northeast of, um, of, it's in northeast Spain, but it is south of, Bar of Barcelona. Barcelona. So, okay. and it is also south of Priorat, which is a very, like, I want to say, a hot area of Spain, but when I say it, as in hot, I mean like the wines are hot. These are like high alcohol wines in this area usually. So whereas like the whites we were drinking were all about 13, 13 and a half percent. Now we're gonna go to, I wanna say that this is probably like 14.5. Yep, 14.5 percent. So we're gonna jump a couple mm -hmm. percentages and you're gonna taste it. <laughs> And you're probably going to feel it, but in a good way. <laughs> so, right? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's the good thing, right? <laughs> Being neighbors. It's close by. <laughs> so I really love this wine. Um, so this is a blend of 45% Grenache, 25% Carignan, 15% Cabernet Sauvignon, and 15% Syrah all made from parcels of 15 to 90 year old vines planted in sandy soils with different mineral compositions. Um, I did ask these, each of these varietals is individually fermented and then this blend is made after they're all fermented. So they're all hand harvested. Each thing is picked. Each of these varietals is picked when it's ripe and when it's ready. So, and then they start basically fermenting and aging them in stainless steel. And then also in, um, they are aged for three to four months in French and American oak barrels. And then it's racked in underground concrete tanks for an additional 12 months. And I wanna say that that's when it's blended and then it's aged in the underground concrete. So, and that's just kind of to allow it to kind of come together. <laughs> it's almost like a- Huh? It's a concrete tank? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, there's lots. Yeah. yeah. They use them yeah. a lot in Bordeaux. A yeah. lot of the castle have those big concrete tanks. Yeah, it's a thing, especially in Europe, because that's pretty much like that's the old way of making wine. So mm -hmm. a lot of the old sellers, like they just use their natural resources, which is what is around them. And concrete's one of mm -hmm. one of the most natural resources. Yeah, that's what they used a lot anyway. Yeah. I mean, even in uh, some of the Chateau that I went over there in Bordeaux, they had, they had the, the room where they have the big stainless steel tank, but then they have the, most of their aging they do in the concrete. They have another room that is like, looks like it's been there for 100 years and 150 years, where the new stainless steel look very pretty and clean, but they still use a concrete. They use a mixture of the two. Uh, I think they age it more in the concrete and then they put in the stainless steel so it doesn't change anymore, basically. They hold it until they bottle it. But this is um, the blend I was just listening to what you say. It's yeah. a lot, lot like a own blend. It is. Than a Spanish blend. Well, and it's really, if you think about it, it's just on the other side, you yeah. know, like of, of, of the Mediterranean Sea. So it makes sense, you know, like mm -hmm. Rhone's right there. And then on the other side of, of you have Spain and then you have pretty much like, I know this is a little bit farther south mm -hmm. than the other areas that we were talking about, which are more of that like Northern Rhone it's style. Nice. But I, yeah, I really nice love the, the fruit juiciness of mm -hmm. this wine and like how alive the acidity is in it. So we were thinking, I mean, Charlie was mentioning this cheese, and he was the one who recommended this one. And he's he's around the corner, I think, maybe unless he already went home. But um, but this is, I'll let you talk about the cheese. Yeah, this is this is, uh, like this is Campo de Montalban, yeah. which is a Spanish cheese, and 
is made similarly to a manchego. Mm -hmm. uh, it's basically made just like the manchego, but using instead of just using sheep milk, which manchego usually are, this has added cow milk also and and uh, and goat milk. So all three milk are present in this one. It's it's done the same way. It's molded and it aged for this six to nine months before you take it out, and it developed that that nice flavor and a little bit of uh, minerality and and uh, it's it's uh, it's not as sharp as a manchego because of the addition of the other milk manchego is usually pretty sharp cheese because it's all sheep milk and sheep is the most the sharpest one of all the cheese meat is a little uh, goat is a little bit more of the the funkier one of the milk and and so the it, they created a good balance so then the cheese has a nice flavor but it's not uh, it doesn't like attack your test bud like a manchego then he's a year old will do because he has that sharpness and the crystals from from aging that long so it is uh, most likely i think it's the same reason that the three milk in italy is that in this part of Spain, there's not that many grassy land for the cows to to graze. So they have a lot of goats, they have a lot of uh, sheep, and uh, that's something they need to use the milk too. Uh, they use it. They use a lot of the meat for for their own co consumption of meat, probably the sheep. Uh, but uh, they don't. They need to use the milk too. So. They've added, they have a lot of sweet milk cheeses in Spain, uh, including some soft one. And this is like medium hard to me. It's not as hard as a manchego yeah. would be. And it, it's, it's got a nice, um, it's almost like a it's cross. It's creamier to me. It's creamier than a manchego. <laughs> it's, somewhere, it's somewhere, I think, between like a, a, a drunken goat in, in consistency and a, and a manchego. But with the flavor of the manchego. We were using but, a, a, a US cheese that we're all familiar with, Monterey Jack. <laughs> oh. no, I don't as think the so. as the first, like the first when you first bite into it, but then you taste the goat and it kind of like and then it changes the profile and it gets a little bit more barnyardy mm -hmm. and richer. Um it is really one good. of the, the things that it, one of the tricks that um a friend of ours does, and he he got me into into doing it as well. Was try the cheese by itself first, then try the wine after, then go back and then try the cheese again, and like make a note of that first one. Then try the cheese again before you swallow the cheese all the way. Then add the wine into your mouth with the cheese to see how that interaction is. See how that interacts, and then that's number two. <laughs> And it's interesting because when I did the second one, it actually made the cheese a little bit sweeter with, and it brought uh, to me, in, in my opinion, like that's where I finally tasted the sheep's milk in it. Well, I, had so, the, I had the cheese. But maybe it's my imagination. I had, <laughs> I had the cheese and one little fig. I did that too. That was and, my third that I was going to say. These are little Spanish figs as mm -hmm. well. That I We also, like, that's what I did my, on my third one of trying this cheese is do that with a, one of those little figs together and that's also uh, and delicious it, and then it, that helps it kind of bring the it bring the tannin that yeah uh, more too yeah and it mellowed out the acidity in my mm. opinion to, to yeah. it as well when i did it with the fig it's fun <laughs> i think it's a really interesting twist on it's fun to experiment. <laughs> and it's, it's fun to balance things in function of what they have. So yeah. you always try to balance your fat with some acid. Mm -hmm. And and the, the umami kind of thing with the fruit so that it... And texture. Mm. With the so tannins. that's what we try to do. Same when we put the, the, as the condiment with it. Now I'm sure it will be real good with the almond too. To have oh, the cheese. I haven't done that yet. Because it's got the <laughs> nice Spanish almond mm -hmm. with a Spanish paprika, so that kind of spice up your cheese. And 
Well, One wing. wine, many ways. <laughs> That's why it's fun. <laughs> right? I know, I know. <laughs> I know, whenever we do these, I'm always, I feel like that. And we talk to people afterwards and they're like, yeah, it's like watching you guys get drunk. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, because we're like powering through this, you know, to do it in an hour. So by like number three, number four, I do feel like that. Like it does kick in and I feel like I am like. <laughs> and Raymond's stories get longer and then and Tom is going, okay, wrap it up, wrap it up. <laughs> I have a lot so, of stories. You know, <laughs> these things happen sometimes. <laughs> but um same thing too i was gonna mm -hmm. I, I was gonna say if you've left any of the latour <laughs> cheese here with us. <laughs> from the beginning it would be a nice cheese to have with this red wine too yeah the kind of so we'll try that 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 creamy the probably the creamy part yeah <laughs> i'm just gonna put it in my mouth or not, I do not. So there's not really a, a tight rule. Uh, you know, you got to keep experimenting. Like, you know, if you have four cheese and four wine, you can just play around and see what yeah. what you feel is the right thing. Brings out the acidity. And both. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and then, and, and if it's oh, not, yeah. <laughs> if it's not a good mix, it will tell you right away because it's got to do something either to the wine yeah. or the cheese then it's not pleasant mm -hmm. so if it's if it's not pleasant mix it's you you'll know right away because yeah. the yeah. cheese and the wine react to each other so don't be afraid to try you know and if you have to spit something out that's okay then the next time you don't try that right <laughs> that's where there's two glasses <laughs> right <laughs> yeah we, we we make a dumb glass sometimes out of the other one not here, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> but we've been to some other wine tastings where we've had to jump sometimes. Yeah, like so, today. Yeah. <laughs> so now we're going to go back to Italy. And, yeah. And a little bit further on the meat. but And a little bit further on the meats. Yes. In the same direction. I was just going to say, Tom, where's your glass? Let's change the banner. Yeah. All righty. So this is Poggio Le Volpi, and this is the Romo Rosso, D-O-C. And so Poggio Le Volpi is a third generation, um, very similar to the Day family, but this is a patriarch instead of a um, whereas I, I want to say, it, I don't feel like it's Katarina. I feel like I'm, I'm, it's not like, that's not her name. And I, I'm mad at myself that I, I can't remember her name right now. I know that it starts with a C and I am so sorry, but she, this, she is a third generation. It was two, two, her, her grandfather and her father before her. And this has, has stayed all guys, grandfather, grandfather prior to him. And mm -hmm. with this one, each generation made their mark in different ways. So with this one, grandfather who was, I think I put that in, in here, Manit, Manlio Merge. Um, he started this winery back in 1920. So we're a little over a hundred years old here. And then, um, and when he started it, he was really into wine and oil and agriculture. That was really his main thing was just like, let's get the agriculture established in this area. We, he really believed that this area was just fantastic for agriculture. And just to kind of give you an idea of where this is in Italy, I feel like it's in the knee. It's in the kneecap of Italy. So if that helps you give a reference. <laughs> so I feel like Italy is like a, a, a long leg of a boot kicking, you know? Yeah, and this is in the knee area. So, and it's very, it's, it's basically um, Lactio. Um, but it's not it's its own doc now it's not lazio which is next door to it but it's it is um it's very close to that region and so when he started it he was very focused on on making wine growing grapes in in olives for olive oil and then his son took over and he was very into making the wine better and making a name for the region and putting the region on the map with great kind of like modernizing the winery, 
really getting everyone together in the region to say, and also buying properties and buying properties and becoming the large, like one of the larger producers in this area, basically. Then his son now is the one who is, is um, running that and that is Felice. And Felice is really into bringing this into more of an international market. So that's how we have this here in the US uh, because it's not, there's a lot of wine produced around the world. And so yeah. it takes a lot to actually like get your wine out to the US. And a lot of people don't necessarily understand like and, and come to us and go like, hey, I have this friend who has their family owns a winery in wherever. And we go, okay, great. How do they distribute here? And that right away is like, no, but they would love to. How do we do that? And I'm like, well, Florida is a three tier state. And there is a lot of bureaucracy that goes into that. And unfortunately, that's the truth of the matter. And it's been that way for a long time. And it's probably going to be that way for a long time more, unfortunately, mm -hmm. because I just don't think anyone's interested in changing the way that it is. So what does that mean that it's harder to get wine shipped into Florida from? Because you have to buy it. You have to buy it from through what it means by a three tier state is that we have to buy from a distributor. We're not allowed to buy directly from the winery. <laughs> we have to go through a middleman. Okay. So that's what that means. And that middleman is who the state deals with and who the, the feds deal with, basically. And, and they wine... deal with that with importing and exporting laws and labeling laws and all of that stuff to keep in regulation and keep everybody doing the same things consistently. And I'm sure they're the one with the lobbyists too. <laughs> it just is. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and people have jobs because of this. So <laughs> it is what it is. <laughs> But it also creates, it makes it difficult if you're a small winery, you know, in Italy or wherever, whatever country that you're in to get your product outside of your area and into the U.S. market. So in specifically state by state and Florida is we're one of the top two states, actually, like we're number two uh, for consumption. So you kind of want to get into Florida and also into New York. Yeah, so because we have Miami, we have yeah. Miami and we have Tampa, two major ports for international. So that's really, you know, like the logistics of it in a nutshell. <laughs> so, so for them to do that and now get to that stage is really a big deal, is my point. So that's what now the third generation, um, that's really what he's done, is he brought them now to an international stage, which sets them in a different bar of production and so that's why we have this now here and so this is a blend of Montepulciano which is a grape and also a region if you remember we started out in Montepulciano Italy so that is something for you to know and, and remember there is two there is a grape and there is a region in Tuscany so and they are different <laughs> Because you can grow Montepulciano anywhere in the world, kind of. I mean, it doesn't grow good everywhere around the world, but you can grow that anywhere. But Montepulciano is only in one place. So in Italy, anyway, is recognized as a wine designation. <laughs> so it also has Syrah and then also um, Cessines, which is a, an indigenous local varietal that they grow there. So. Yeah. Okay. And so this is, um, and then this is, they didn't really, I could not find that much information on how this wine is made. Um, so I know though that they are definitely like big on becoming a, like they're big on becoming a wine. They are a modern winery. So they do a lot of stainless steel mm -hmm. fermentation. And then I would imagine that this is aged in oak. And I don't remember um, how long it's aged in oak, but I do know that it is aged in oak. It does taste some oak for sure. So it's nice, kind of like nice, dark and broody, but without being overbearing, in my opinion. There's a nice balance to its broodiness. So they are. It's got structure. Yeah. It was such like a big tannin situation. It would be a huge wine as well, but they somehow. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's very mm -hmm. structured. So I now think. I'll go to the meat that we've paired with this. Uh, the meat is not something you'll find everywhere because 
it's uh, it's called Suchuk, and it's it's a product that has been made since about 500 BC by the by the population around the Mediterranean, including yeah, the Balkan, uh, Lebanon, Palestine, all the way back to to the Central Asia, Pakistan, Afghanistan. They all have their own version, and all the the Eastern Europe, like Hungary and 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 Romania, and they all make a, a sujuk version. The, what it is is a usually coarse ground meat. Then they use to make that. Uh, it's always more. I mean, I'd say ninety percent of the time, it's 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 beef blended with another meat. Uh, in this case, it's beef and lamb, and you can you will test the lamb. You will also test one of the main spices they use, and they, when they dry the meat, they make they make it like the Italian make a salami basically. But they also use sumac in there, which will give it that. You will taste that kind of lemony uh, flavor from the sumac that is used all over uh, Middle East, uh, North Africa, and all that, which is a real nice flavor to go with with wine. Um, it's been made with. Uh, thing that Sunny will make American farm, but it's been it's been made also with beef, horse, horse meat, uh, lamb, and other meats. So it's the, if they have game, they will use game meat too. So, but it's it's uh, it's. This is beef and lamb. <laughs> what? This, this one is beef yeah. and lamb. Yeah, no horse. Yeah, no horse. <laughs> just to, just just to clarify, <laughs> Raymond's talking about horse meat, and sometimes I just want to not scare people. <laughs> Let me, uh, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, right? Well, I wish we could bring it in, but it's not. The USDA doesn't allow that, so you kind of save there. But uh, it's so it's 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 cured and it's then uh, dried and it's it's a meat and uh, is nice like a salami. You can put that in your backpack when you go hiking and. Uh, you know, and slice it. It doesn't have to be cold. It's, you can leave it at room temperature, like any salami. Um, and uh, it, it's really a flavorful meat that I like to have always with like some little bit wine and have a little bit of a b body to them, either like Rhone wine, Zinfandel, this. Uh, this this is something that can stand to a lot of the, without covering the the wine because it's, it has some really um, uh, definite flavors to it and what i like is got that little barbecue lemon in, lemon flavor to it from the sumac so it's kind of a nice product it's made all over in, uh, one of our uh, founder is is from serbia and when we got it say oh i used to eat that when i was a kid you know over there so it's something that all the people in that the part Balkan, of the Balkans. Yeah, the yeah. Balkan and, and most of the Mediterranean. Yeah. They they know Suchuk. So and like I say, it's been made for over two thousand years. So uh, I guess they got this thing pretty much figured out. <laughs> it's considered a salami? It's made the same way than a salami, but it's it's a cured it's a dried cured meat. Okay. They marinate the meat too, so it's it's getting those flavor. From other spice besides the, the sumac. But the sumac is very prominent in, in the flavor, I think. Uh, I made a roll up with the sour cherries in the sujik, and it's kind of delicious together. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I made be. a roll up with, of the sour of the cherries yeah. together in the sujik, and it's kind of delicious together. Mm -hmm. And then taste the wine, and it, they, they definitely like pop each other in a fun mm -hmm. way. Yeah, you do get rid of sweet things. Mm hmm. <laughs> mm. I love that. It almost has like a like a sharp herbal quality to it, also that reminds me of like thyme or some other kind of like herb. Mm -hmm. And there's is... cumin or something. Is it cumin? Yeah. Uh, is I'm there any sure. cumin in it? I don't know for sure. Okay. But it's marinated with spices, so depending on the yeah. version, I'm not sure what's in okay. this one. Yeah, so this one is this one is by the spot of Trotter, which is out of Georgia, actually. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's an American like, version. And, of, yeah, 
an artisan but it's a very good it's a very good version yeah i have I, yeah we've been having a hard time getting an, an imported version of this so yeah but it's not i mean it's just like maybe the same problem the italian had to at the beginning to get the salami in mm -hmm. if somebody doesn't make it here first yeah to make people wanting to get it in they don't bring it in and then this one by the way is 14 percent not to not 14.5 isn't it mm -hmm. i want to say that it's right under 30 dollars so yeah and we're we're getting their rosé in tomorrow as well we're getting their rosé in as well tomorrow so they also do a still rosé of this in an equally beautiful bottle and it's basically just like a rosé of their multiple chiano so it is yeah it's very nice so and the wine kind of bring out the yeah. spice even more on the it wine. does yeah it's they, like that's what i thought too most, that's why i was like there's this herbal quality that the wine is pulling out yeah. yeah exactly and one of the things that they that they mentioned on uh for this this is that this area in particular this vineyard site was surrounded by chestnut woods which mm -hmm. i thought was really interesting and i feel like there's kind of like you have that a little bit in in this wine like that like there's a, a nice like sweet earth kind of feeling to it as well and also quality well, to of, it italy's got a lot of chestnut gold yeah chestnut and hazelnut a lot of that i am that makes sense yeah yeah Yay. Well, any questions? <laughs> All right. Well, we uh, will do our quick um, house housekeeping um, announcements. I guess our, let's see, our hours for the summertime are going to be Tuesday through Thursday. We open at 2 o'clock. We close at 9 o'clock. We're open at 12 p.m. Um, for lunch on Friday and Saturday, and then we close at 9.30 our kitchen still closes at nine those nights, but we stay open later for anyone who wants to come by and enjoy some wine with us. Our next sip and stretch with Taylor is this Saturday. And then, um, and then, oh, <laughs> well, hopefully we'll see you at the next one. And then we also have our second wine walk, um, St. Pete's. So we, we started wine walk with some wine friends of ours. Um, so we're, we're adding Fourth and Vine this month to our wine walk and extending a little bit into Old Northeast, which will hopefully help with anyone who's driving here from outside of this area. You can park there, walk, take your scooter, bike, do whatever you want. Be responsible, of course, but mm -hmm. enjoy yourself. It's a beautiful time of the year. Um, and so basically it's, it's us and fourth and vine book and bottle bar chinchilla and american spirits so we're all doing different things and making like have different promotions from five o'clock to nine o'clock and it's just all in the spirit of, it takes place along with art walk and so um so it's just basically our way of of doing art and wine together wine so because we can't be at art walk galleries because our license is for our place and so this is our way of being able to participate in one of the our favorite events for St. Pete, which is Art Walk. So, but this is yeah. art anyway, and it is. I feel that wine is well, art, and so cheese. and cheese <laughs> and all of it. It's all craft, and we're just very happy to to be part of it. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So those are our events. Oh, and we have a Rioja winemaker dinner. We have Carlos Fernandez from Bodegas Tierra, and also Chris. Creation Lexia, which I'm probably saying it wrong, and I'm sorry, but he is going to be here, and we're going to taste a lot of his Spanish wines from his entry level all the way up to his super high end single vineyard new projects that we don't even have here yet in Florida. So that is on April 21st, which is a Thursday, and then that's also Todd Smith's birthday, and he's our host that night for that event. So. And if you, if anyone remembers Todd from Winesmith, so yeah, and that's pretty much our events for April. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and the next learning to fly will be in May. Will be in May. And we'll figure out what we're doing then. 
Because <laughs> I don't remember off the top of my head. <laughs> so we'll see you all later. Have a great night. Ciao. <laughs>